this is kind of a retail revolution. If it does come to fruition, you're going to have fantastic returns. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Value Tokenized. I'm Masha. And I'm Zenia. And today we're interviewing Demelza Hayes, manager of Liechtenstein based in Clement and Crypto One Fund and writer of Crypto Research Report. Demelza has been in blockchain field since 2013, and this year she was awarded 30 under 30 by Forbes in finance. <laughs> So, hi, Jamel. So, we're really excited to have you with us on Value Tokenized. You've been conducting research in the field of crypto assets since 2013, which is really impressive. And what are the main trends that you have seen evolving since that time? And how did we get here where we are now? Well, let's see. Since 2013, you have to think of what the major trends were. There, First, there was the blockchain not bitcoin trend where everybody wanted to use blockchain but they didn't want to mention bitcoin because bitcoin had some some bad connotations because of the silk road and mount gox getting hacked um and then i think a lot of firms went in the blockchain direction so there was like the r3 consortium and there was hyperledger and there was different banks that were experimenting with blockchain technology Yep. And then like many studies came out during this time, most of the cryptocurrency enthusiasts were on Reddit and on Bitcoin talk. And I remember whenever some news would come out, like for example, Bank of England exploring blockchain pilot project and everybody would get super excited because we all thought, I guess we all thought that this was happening, you know, quickly, like the, the transition into using blockchain was happening quickly, but then a lot of these projects over time, like they just didn't become anything like Bank of England didn't end up switching their their inner bank settlements to using blockchain. They just kind of went through the pilot and then the pilot ended and that was the end of it, you know, and a lot of banks were leaving some of the consortiums that they had originally joined. So then it kind of went back to Bitcoin a little bit, like around 2015, the price uh, of Bitcoin started to slightly um, go up. And I think that a lot of people thought, okay, Bitcoin's interesting again. And then what happened was we transitioned to the, into this phase of altcoins. So all these altcoins started hitting the market. Um, for example, Ethereum started, getting, uh, st started being developed and it was launched in 2016. And around Ethereum, there was a bunch of other coins that were released at that time. And then slowly... Um, other coins came out into the market that were based on the Ethereum blockchain. So then you had this movement into these ICOs and you had a lot of firms raising capital very quickly without a lot of um, thought being put into the business model underneath, underlying the, the ICO. And then we had kind of like the big um, bust of, of the bubble um, in 2000, late 2017, early 2018. And since then, I think people have now kind of broken off into two main groups. There's the Bitcoin people that are like maximalist, and they really think that Bitcoin is the future with second layer, second layer um, protocols like Lightning or Liquid that are going to make Bitcoin like a global reserve and medium of exchange. And then you have the group of people that are going towards the security token offerings that think that a security token can offer equity or revenue sharing or represent a debt instrument. And I think that these are kind of like two different avenues now that we're going into. There's the, the people that are really looking for a global reserve currency. And then there's the people that are looking for revolutionizing uh, the stock market and how we trade stocks. Uh, do you think that security tokens are actually, you know, some kind of a pivot and a ruining force for the initial idea of decentralization, which blockchain was initially about? or it's just like a completely new movement uh, that can change financial markets? The, the viewpoint of a Bitcoin maximalist, I think that it's okay to go in the direction of security token offerings for people that wanna raise equity. So I think that raising capital with debt or with equity instruments, I think that's a normal part of a functioning financial market. So 
for me, it's totally fine that people are going in that direction. And I think that's great because I think that a lot of the other coins, like for example, Ethereum or EOS or Stellar, they all claim to have unique applications such as being able to support smart contracts. But at the end of the day, when you look at these business models, I think that really the only use case that we're seeing is store of value and medium of exchange. So I think that even though VitaLeak said Ethereum's not trying to compete with Bitcoin, I think that at the end of the day, Bitcoin and Ethereum were competing. And I think that with the STOs, that's not a competition for Bitcoin because Bitcoin is trying to become, or like people are using it as a store of value and medium of exchange across the globe, whereas STOs represent equity ownership or they represent a debt instrument where investors can gain interest payments over time or dividend payments over time. So this is, this is just a way to raise capital. So I think that this is great for the industry because now we've kind of understand, understood the different applications of these two, of these two technologies. And I think that people can go down whichever track they want. Now we're not going to have ICOs that don't offer any equity or any debt and yet claim to be not competing with Bitcoin. Um, and, and instead we're going to have STOs that, that have a very clear uh, business case. So I think that's, that's much better for me. And what is the main benefits of tokenizing equity or debt in your opinion? I think the, the whole goal is to have more liquidity. So if you have private equity, it's really hard to trade your shares with anyone. And for investors in that early stage venture, it's really hard for them to liquidate their positions if they want to leave that venture. There's only really two ways to get out, which is either through acquisition by a larger firm or by going to an IPO. So I think that by allowing investors to trade, their early stage investments, then they can uh, leave their position when they want. They're not locked in. And I think that that's gonna encourage more investors to get involved in the first place because they know they can, they have the liquidity, they have the ability to get out. Unfortunately, right now, there's not really an active exchange where people can trade these pre, uh, pre um, IPO private equity tokens. But I think that in the future, once that's released, people will be able to, to trade. And I think that that's, yeah, that's going to encourage more investment early on. Um, in one of your articles, you say that tokenization actually existed before, uh, before blockchain, before security tokens uh, um, in form of certificates. Um, can you tell us more about this instrument and what are the differences between them and between security tokens? Well, yeah, thanks a lot for the question, Masha. Um, and thanks for reading my article. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. There's a company in Zug called Gentoo, and they work with certification of any kind of asset. So it could be a plane, for example, it could be a house, it could be revenue shares from a cattle farm in Bolivia, it could be anything. And when you want to make a certificate, what you have to do is first you have to set up a SPV, um, which is a special purpose vehicle, which can be used to then issue certificates. So once you, because you can't just issue certificates unless you basically have a vehicle from, in, from within which to issue these certificates. So for example, if you opened up an SPV in Cayman, or if you opened up an SPV in Isle of Man, then what you could do is, is take a tangible asset or a non-tangible asset and make it into a certificate which investors can invest in. And I think this is really similar to tokens, except tokens, I think, and this is where the interesting part is for the future, tokens probably have lower cost to start. Um, and they also probably have lower barriers to entry for investors. So on the one hand, it's going to cost less to get assets tokenized once the templates are ready and once banks have the infrastructure in place to just go ahead and issue tokens. And on the other hand, if the regulators are willing to work with tokens as um, 
representative of the ownership of that investment contract, then there's also probably going to be lower barriers to entry for investors. So for example, right now, a lot of certificates are not open to retail investors. And I think that's what's really great about this space because what it's doing is it's pulling in a lot of retail people to understand financial products and to understand money and to understand how our financial markets work. So I think that's, that's one of the really big benefits here is that this is kind of a retail revolution. It's where we're asking, wait, how do, inve how do investments work? How do I earn a return? How do I save for the future? What's the best way to hedge inflation? You know, and all these questions come up and it's really opening up the dialogue, which was traditionally only between institutional investors. And as a manager of Incrementum Crypto Fund Fund, can you tell us more about the fund's strategy and investment focus? Unfortunately, since we're work working in the regulated space, that's a regulated product and it's only for professional investors and not for retail. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think tokenization and, and, and the future is, is so exciting because many retail products will come out on the market that will actually compete with, with our product. And, and we are looking at taking the next steps in order to be able to launch our product for retail investors. Um, but I can say that, you know, not talking specifically about our product, I can say that I've looked at a lot of different strategies over the past couple of years. I've tried mean reversion strategies, um, mean variance optimization strategies, robust optimization strategies, minimum variance optimization strategies. Uh, I've tried strategies based on network effects, hash rate, market sentiment, like um, sentiment analysis. And in the end, the strategy that I like a lot is, I guess, the strategy that I feel the most capable implementing. And that is basically focusing on gold and Bitcoin. So I think that gold and Bitcoin are both competing to become global reserves and store of value uh, assets. So gold is already a store of value, but the problem is, is that gold isn't digital and it can't move very easily. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is digital. It can move very easily, but it has a lot of technology risks. It's only been on the market for 10 years and a lot of people don't trust it the way they trust gold. So, you know, we're focusing on finding the cryptocurrencies that can actually become global store of value and medium of exchange, whereas other funds are focusing on investing in security token offerings in an early stage. And I think that, you know, maybe in the future we would go in that direction, but for us, security token offerings are basically like private equity right now. Once they become traded, they might be like stocks. And in that sense, then we would have to be stock pickers. You know, we would have to understand how to pick the right stocks in order to have a fund based on security token offerings. And for us, Incrementum has been around since 2013 in, in Liechtenstein. They were previously in Zug since 2008. And their main products are gold funds. So the amount, all the other, they have five other funds and they're all based on commodities and on tangible physical assets. So we are kind of combining our experience with gold and then coming to the cryptocurrency market and looking for a similar store of value a token or coin. So our strategy is, is well, I can't, can't speak about our strategy exactly, but what I can say is that somebody could use a rebalancing band in order to, um, you know, target how much exposure they want to have to Bitcoin, how much exposure they want to have to gold, for example, how much exposure they want to have to other cryptocurrencies that might compete with Bitcoin, such as stable coins like MakerDAO. I think that's a very interesting coin right now. Um, and then what you can do is once the coin gets too far out of the, the band, so for example, if it becomes 30% of your portfolio and you only want it at 20%, you can then go ahead and write an option to, to sell that amount of the difference between what you want your weight to be at and, what you, and, what, and where your weight is. So you can use a combination of options and rebalancing bands in order to keep your portfolio in some kind of long-term range. And yeah, that's, that's kind of one strategy because you get to benefit from the premiums on the calls that you write. 
uh, the call options that you write and you also get to benefit from the put options that you write um, if, if the price is starting to go down, if the weight of your asset is starting to go down. And I think that it also allows you to manage the volatility of this asset class because Bitcoin is so volatile and a lot of institutional and professional investors that are familiar with gold or are familiar with traditional assets don't want to take on the volatility and the max drawdown potential of 80% you know, of Bitcoin. So instead, if you mix it in with assets that are have a low correlation with Bitcoin, you can somehow, not somehow, but you can increase the performance, the portfolio performance, the risk return uh, adjusted performance of the portfolio, because when gold goes up, Bitcoin doesn't go down. When Bitcoin goes up, gold doesn't go down. It's not positively correlated or negatively correlated. Whatever gold does, Bitcoin's doing something else. So this allows you to basically have lower variance in the price return of the entire portfolio when you mix them together. So that's kind of where we're coming at. We're focusing on what is gonna be the future of, of money. And <clears throat> security token offerings are you know, in a different direction. And, and I think it's really interesting to see how that, that field moves as well. And you mentioned Incrementum's interest in launching or like retail a product for retail investors. And do you think that Liechtenstein regulation is positive for public offerings or not? Towards public offerings, well, Liechtenstein doesn't have a stock market. So if we wanted to list, we would have to list on the Austrian stock market or on the Swiss stock market. And I think right now, uh, the the Swiss stock exchange six and their counter their um, digital exchange SDX are probably leading the way in this as far as letting people tokenize assets and go to IPO or go to I'm not sure how, how you want to call it they haven't but they're going to officially call it yet but basically go to IPO with a token um, but that hasn't really come into fruition yet. They are estimating that they're going to need another two years at the six exchange before they're ready to really do that. And they're taking some pilot projects on with local companies that have tokens. And they're saying, you know, how could we bring you to the stock market? Um, and how could we get you launched on, on the six exchange? I mean, right now, one of our funds is open to retail investors. But that fund cannot have more than 20% exposure to cryptocurrencies because the regulators here at FMA still think that cryptocurrencies are too risky to allow retail investors to invest large portions of, of their savings into, large portions of their wealth into. So, you know, it depends on who you talk to. If you talk to some of the regulators at the FMA, they, they'll say things like, oh, every... ICO that we approve is a security offering. And then I'll be like, okay, but that sounds really strange because if you take this to Austria, the, you know, Liechtenstein's in the EEA. So it should be the case that any licensing that occurs here, any approval status that occurs here should be able to be passported to any of the European Union countries. So if any of the ICOs that the FMA and Liechtenstein approve could be passported as securities to the EU, I mean, that would be humongous. I mean, I just think that would be, you know, such a, a news, you know, such a newsworthy um, event. But I don't re really think other financial market authorities are treating ICOs approved in Liechtenstein as securities in, in other countries. So I think that there's still some you know, regulatory uncertainty about what Liechtenstein can do and, and what approval actually means here. I mean, there's some tokens that are trying to offer revenue sharing or, or ownership in the company. And I've heard that when they really press the fact that they are security, like the, the firm sits with a meeting at the FMA and they really press, look, we think we're a security. We don't want to be regulated by your fintech side. We want to be regulated by your security side of, of, of the FMA. When they keep pushing that they're a security, then the FMA takes a lot more time on that, on that approval. 
You know, when, when the company comes out and says, we are a regulated security approved by the FMA, you know, that's a lot more than if the company kind of flies under the radar, offers a semi-security looking thing, but doesn't call it a security. You know, and that's kind of what's been going on so far, that the FMA has been approving a lot of ICOs. The ICOs are actually just making like a company in Liechtenstein, such as an Anstalt or an AG or GmbH, and they don't have any kind of prospectus approved or um, due diligence. You know, they don't have any disclosures or anything like that. So I think right now it's really confusing what's going on there. Uh, and I think a lot of firms are still waiting to understand what this means. There are a lot of uh, infrastructure projects for security tokens emerging on the market right now, like special exchanges or issuance platforms. So do you think that they are um, a good investment in the first place and how they will um, actually you know, combine with uh, traditional institutions on the financial landscape? Well, that's another good question, Masha. Um, let's see. I think, you know, that's a whole another investment um, strategy is to invest in these companies that I think are trying to compete with the stock market. So any company that wants to trade or issue Swiss-based security tokens is going to be competing with whatever product six launches in two years from now. Any company in the US that wants to create a platform where tokens can trade as securities that are that are regulated as securities is going to be competing with the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. So I think it it, it you know it could be a good investment in the sense that these companies might be able to to just completely cut cost and make stock issuance and stock trading much more streamlined, much more affordable, much more um, controlled by algorithms, you know, much more kind of on autopilot. And so you might have a startup that can really do this. Like for example, um, Harbor in the US or the um, T0 project um, in the US or Polymath, or I mean, here you have like a bunch of projects here, Neufund um, in Germany, and then you have Swisscom trying to compete with their Dower project. And then in Liechtenstein, you have two or three different companies trying to do this. And I think it's a long, it's a long bet. I mean, this is really like, you know, I, I wouldn't put too much on it, but if it does come to fruition, you're gonna have fan fantastic returns. So it, it, it's, it's a very risky bet. Um, and the way I like to think about risky bets is, let's say I allocate 1% of my total wealth to it. Okay, 1%, I invest in platforms that are gonna compete with stock exchanges. In worst case, I lose 1% of my net wealth. Okay, that's bad, but it's 1%. In best case, Maybe you're going to have a return of, of 100%, you know, or 200% or 1000%. You know, some of, the, some of the early investments that I made in cryptocurrencies just had enormous returns. And the risk that I took was huge, you know, but the returns, you know, were also huge. So I think it's a very risky investment, but there's potential there. I think I would really look at you know, network, who is who is this team that's behind it? Do they actually have the network? Because they're gonna really need, you know, they're gonna need to have people in government. They're gonna need to have legal teams. They're gonna need to have big money behind them in order to compete with whatever large exchange is the legacy exchange in that country. But uh, if they can do the, the business better, then, you know, why, why won't uh, people jump jump to the next better exchange, sure. And do you think it will be easier for existing traditional exchanges to adopt for uh, security token infrastructure or it should be a new exchange uh, created from scratch to be suited to this industry's needs? I personally think that the current stock exchanges are in a better position to adopt the new technology than 
the new the new competitors are in to take over the market held by the incumbents. It's going to be very hard for anyone to break into that space. And also, not only that, they have access to capital. They have years of experience with flash crashes, with um, uh, hypothecation of uh, stocks, with rehypothecation of stocks, with custodianship. I mean, they have so much, so much experience that I think a lot of these startups, even if they are able to get past the regulatory issues, I think a lot of them are going to go bankrupt the first time a flash crash happens. You know, I mean, they're not, they're just not going to have the, the skills and experience necessary to give consumers that end product that they want. Um, you know, a functioning, reliable, liquid stock exchange. So, yeah, I think, I mean, for example, like the six exchange, you know, um, one issue they have is, you know, they, they basically realized that they would need some kind of stable coin within which they could use on their tokenized platform. And when, when I spoke to somebody from the six exchange, I said, well, so does that mean you're going to be creating your own, your own stable coin, your own stable Frank? And they said, well, not exactly. You know, we're working with the S and B so that, so the Swiss national bank, is, work, is, is in some kind of early stage partnership with the six exchange to create a Swiss franc that's tokenized that could be used on the six exchange. And I think that if a startup came and said, look, we have our own stable coin, I think you know, that could attract some investment, but could it compete with the Swiss National Bank? You know, it's, it's I mean, these are really big parts of our society. So I think it's really hard for people to to grasp why we should leave something that's currently working. I think uh, the question probably to finish our interview today, uh, can you um, share your advice and maybe some directions that um, the community should look at in 2019 and maybe some trends that you see coming um, in this period? Okay, 2019, I think that in 2019, people are going to realize that utility tokens are not, do not have a good business model. Okay. So just the idea that, I mean, here's the investment pitch, right? You, the idea is, okay, buy this token, buy Ethereum now in the hopes that a lot of decentralized applications will use the Ethereum smart contracting platform, which in order to use that smart contracting, smart contracting platform, they, they need Ether as gas for the transactions. And that increase in demand for Ether will lead to a higher price of Ether. And therefore, the early investors can kind of front run the later investors and gain a capital gain. Okay, so buy low, sell high. This is the pitch for Ethereum and for a lot of these utility tokens. But for me, it doesn't make any sense because a lot of these dApps rely on low and stable transaction fees. So if the investment pitch is, look, the price is gonna go up, then none of the dApps can actually ever gain adoption because they won't be able to survive in an environment with a fee that's volatile and constantly appreciating. So what I see instead is these dApps that have interesting use cases like for example the basic attention token like where my browser is talking to another browser or for example some loyalty program or you know whatever whatever decent decentralized applications that you can build on a blockchain could be like decentralized facebook or whatever you know all of these things i think they require low and stable transaction fees i don't think they require a fully public decentralized blockchain I don't think people need that much security. They might maybe want a little bit more security, a little bit more control than what we currently have, um, where we're giving up all of our control to centralized party. But I don't think they need the latency, the low transaction confirmation times, the high fees, the instability of fees. I don't think they need that, that aspect. And I don't think they can afford it, these applications. So I think what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a big split into the more like the, the semi-centralized micropayment applications like for example stellar or eos or 
Eternity or XRP or one, you know, these these more centralized use cases. And then I think we're going to have the split into the fully public, decentralized, high cost, volatile assets like Bitcoin, uh, like Dash, Monero, and this. And then to compound that, I think we're going to have the the stable coins and the privacy coins competing with Bitcoin. So I think the question is. Will Bitcoin be able to attract users when there's that much volatility? Or will people prefer stable coins like MakerDAO that offer decentralization and stability? Um, I think that that's, that's, that's a great, that's a great uh, topic for 2019. And I think also for 2019, we're going to see the whole debate between privacy. Like, do we need privacy or not? How much privacy do we need? Can we control how much privacy we, we want to give to each user? So I think that different tools that are being released by, by uh, Blockstream uh, in the US, I think that that's really interesting. And yeah, so basically I think that's it. You know, I think uh, we're going to have a split here into competition between coins to become global reserves and then competition for dApps. And I think that the coins that are like, they don't have an identity, they don't know what they're doing, they're somewhere in between. I think those ones are gonna have to, you know, they're gonna just lose value over time. For being uh, with us at Rally Tokenized. My pleasure. Really our pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much.